Welcome to Grand Sumo Breakdown, the unofficial sumo podcast for official sumo fans. Welcome to Grand Sumo Breakdown. This is Ryan. This is Flarek. And this is Jake. We don't have Mac with us today. Uh, Mac's not crazy. He's just a little unwell. I, I know right now you can't tell because he's not on the podcast. Yeah. Mac actually legitimately 100% hilariously has hand, foot, and mouth disease. <laughs> so he's a little too contagious for my basement. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So a week after his wedding, we're recording this a week after we all got back from Wisconsin. Instead of enjoying any form of honeymoon or time with his new wife, Mac is just sitting at home alone <laughs> because he's super contagious. <laughs> oh, hilarious. Yeah. But today's episode <laughs> is following up on the Americans in Sumo Wrestling bonus episode that we had right at the beginning of the Nagoya Ba show. This is going to be Ake Bono and Musashi Maru, the two American Yokozuna. And once again, with all history based episodes, we're going to turn everything over to Jake. I am the one who does homework. That's right. Uh, as I was researching Americans in sumo, I, I just I I made the call that we should just separate these two out on their own because they're obviously like the most important two American sumo wrestlers. Uh, I mean, you had greats like Takamiyama and Konishiki coming before them, but uh, it was really Ake Bono and um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, slightly later Musashi Maru, who kind of um, being the first two foreign yokozuna, they definitely helped spread uh, you know spread the popularity especially to the United States, about what sumo wrestling really is. So uh, I think, why don't we just start with Ake Bono? He's definitely the the better known of the two. Uh, he was the very first foreign Yokozuna ever. Uh, this was, uh, he got his promotion back in 1993, which was kind of extraordinarily only five years after he started in sumo at all. Very impressive. Yeah, so he didn't he, he didn't come up through like the Japanese university system or anything like that. So obviously he had to work his way up from the very very bottom. Uh, but yeah, still within within f- uh, five years he was all the way at the top and he won a whole bunch of tournaments. But uh, yeah, so why don't we start at the beginning? Uh, he is from Hawaii. Uh, he was born to Randy and Janice, which is kind of funny for sumo wrestler parent names. Uh, yeah, his his birth name is Chad Rowan. Um, yep, that's right. The first foreign born Yokozuna was named Chad. Chad. Um, I, I guess I say <laughs> was Chad. because he's, <laughs> he's still around, but he, um, he, his legal name is now Akebono Taro because he is a Japanese citizen and took on that name to stay in the country. Is that um, different than Konishiki who has to like write his name? Cause he kept Konishiki, but he has to write it in the he, American. He like goes by that name like professionally. I guess I'm not positive if he changed it legally or whatnot, okay. but but Akebono in particular, he he stayed in Japan uh, after sumo, and uh, he, that's that's his legal name now, okay. which is pretty cool because that's probably one of the only ways you can really keep a sumo name because you you have to give them up when you leave. Mm-hmm. Konishiki and Akebono kind of you know found their way around that. Um, but yeah, so he, he was born in Hawaii. He grew up there, and uh, he he came over to uh, Japan specifically to start sumo. Uh, right around 18, 19, 20, somewhere in there, um, because of Takamiyama, uh, one of the main guys we talked about in our previous episode, the the first foreigner to ever win a Yusho. Uh, Takamiyama was a Sekiwake. He wrestled for 20 years until all the way up until 1984. Um, so when Takamiyama quit wrestling, he started a stable, and uh, Akebono was one of the first recruits and certainly the most successful recruit that uh, he was able to bring over. Um, Akebono as a, as a young guy, he, he's six foot eight. So obviously he was in sports from the very beginning. Primarily he were, he played basketball. Oh, I would but have he, assumed football like most of the others. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he, he actually wasn't super, super huge. Um, I mean, girth that wise changed. Yeah, that certainly changed. <laughs> Sumo um, really good at that. <laughs> yeah. Um, girth wise, he didn't start out enormous. He was just extremely tall. So he played basketball growing up. Um, and, uh, sumo, he was just a, a long time fan. Um, and just, uh, connections to Azumazeki or sorry, Takamiyama's coach name, his Oyakata name is Azumazeki. Um, uh, his relationship with him turned into, uh, trying out sumo wrestling. So he went over to Japan and actually debuted in probably the most successful, uh, debuting class of all time. 
uh, because both Takano Hana and Wakano Hana debuted at the same time as him, as well as longtime Ozeki Kayo. They all debuted in the same wow. basho, the exact same basho. So well, I know that like yearly, there's you know there's one particular basho, the the March basho, where you get Adun. more, yeah, more more recruits starting than than at any other point in the year. But still, that's three Yokozuna and a long term Ozeki who started at the exact same time. I think that's, and, that's yeah. cool. and Osaka. Is that correct? Uh, the Haru yes, basho. Yes, that's a Haru one, but it looks like he was in O three is when his Meizuma was. So I think that's Tokyo. Should be. I. Well, Thought the Hatsu is Tokyo, two is Haru, yeah. and then Natsu. Yeah, I think it's Natsu. Oh, uh, three, so is three, in, three, three is in March, March, not three is in the third tournament. Oh, okay, I'm crazy then. Yeah, it's uh, totally Haru then. Yeah, okay. I, I wrote my outline very cryptically, didn't I? No, no, I'm just looking at the stats page. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, they they have it different ways, different places. Yeah. Well, to be yeah, <laughs> yeah, the formatting is silly, but either way, um, but yeah, I, yeah, I agree. What you're saying it's like definitely Haru, which gets like the most people. I think this last term we had like forty five or forty four or so people. Okay, so yeah, we need yeah. to watch out for four of those names to become future Yokozuna and Ozeki if they're going to pass. Mm-hmm. If they're going to surpass the class of uh, nineteen eighty eight, that's what they got to do. And hey, Naya and Hoshoryu, you know, we'll we'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean. I, I'm going to say it right now. Those will both be Yokozuna and some guy that we've never heard of, probably. <gasps> yeah, bold yes. move. Um, but Akebono was he was uh, recruited, of course, because he was super athletic. He was very tall, but um, he was he, he's kind of got a, a top heavy build. He's got very long legs, so there were some doubts that he would um, you know that he would go far. He if he's you know if you're too top heavy, you can get pushed around. You're not as stable. Um, he had the exact opposite build of Musashi Maru coming in. We'll talk <laughs> about him more, of course. But, uh, but Akebono, he, despite his build, he was obviously extremely athletic. Uh, he was very, very good at pushing and thrusting. So he just rocketed right up the rankings. He reached Sekiwake before he ever had his first Make Koshi. That is, he <laughs> wow. tied the all-time record of 18 Kachi Koshis in a row to start his career. So yeah, I mean, it, there was there was not a whole lot of time for him to develop, uh, you know, uh, super polished technique. Um, a lot of it was just raw athleticism, strength, speed. But he did obviously get to Yokozuna. You don't get mm-hmm. there if you're not talented mm-hmm. as well. So yeah, his if, technique his technique also you know came along. He he got a lot of prizes on his way up. Uh, he spent only five basho as a megashira. Then he got Ozeki. Then, That's impressive. Yeah, right. Dang. Less than two years uh, of being an Ozeki, um, and uh, there you go. First ever foreign Yokozuna with winning the two basho in December ninety or excuse me, November of ninety two and January of ninety three. His first year as Yokozuna uh, yeah, was this. This was come off a drought of Yokozuna, wasn't it? I don't think there was like there was a, that spot was open for like a little bit. I think before he got promoted. Um, I might be wrong. We, yeah, why don't we look that up so that we don't yeah. sound silly? I don't know off the top of my head, but either way, he he got two you show in a row, so it wasn't like controversial. First two? No, he actually won one as a Sekiwake. Okay, so he 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 won uh, thirteen and two, got an outstanding prize, uh, outstanding performance prize as a Sekiwake, and then two Basho later is when he started his streak. So this first year and a half or so of uh, once he comes into his own, is definitely the the peak of of his career. He peaked a little bit early in his career compared to how long he stuck around. Um, he didn't retire until 2001 officially, but in 1992, 93, and early 94, that's when he was really he he really peaked. So it, at one stretch after he became Yokozuna, he had a 10 and five iffy record, but still you know high quality. 13 and two, he got a runner up. And then four of the next five Bashos, he just rattles them off, wins all of them. Three of them by playoffs, um, including one of them, I believe, was a five-way playoff. Oh, wow. Yeah, so a like, handful of matches in there. But um, either way, that, that was definitely his peak. In 1993 to 1999, he missed a lot of tournaments due to you know the inevitable injuries that pop up. This was also the time that the uh, Hanas, uh, Takano Hana and Wakano Hana, were, were pretty dominant. Otherwise known as the Brothers Ohana. The Brothers Ohana, yeah. I, I yes, mean, by many people, right? By many, yes. by many people. <laughs> Very at this popular table. throughout all the countries. Very yeah, popular amongst this table. DJ Takano Hana went by many names before. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, but yeah, so he he did keep winning Basho's occasionally. Yeah, I I got uh, I looked it up. Uh, yeah, there was a. Uh, the the last couple uh, Yokozuna uh, retired in 1992, and so in the 93 was when uh, Akibono got promoted. So there was at least a little bit of a year, or maybe a little bit less of a gap between then. And gotcha. interesting enough, it looks like in 91, 92 there were four Yokozuna that actually uh, retired in that year. Oh wow! I remember reading a there was a Tachiyai article about that, right? Wasn't there like four Yokozuna to zero in a year? I, I think I read I that same so, yeah. article. Yeah. Yeah, either that or we're both making up the same memory. But either way, it's yeah. So it but, wasn't it wasn't a bit of a drought of Yokozuna. Exactly, and it kind of seemed like it was a generational kind of turnover of words. Like we had some like really uh, powerful Yokozuna who mm. were dominant at the time, and they're all kind of just falling off, you know, getting older and then retiring, and then they have some upstarts like Akabono and uh, what an later interesting people jumping or Toji Noshin and Mitake Yumi, as we are saying now. Takeyasu, please. <laughs> uh, uh, no, how old is that guy? <laughs> He's twenty eight. Yeah, he's younger than uh, those. Either way, though, yeah, it it, um, it wasn't controversial, regardless of if there were other Yokozuna winning two Basho in a row as an Ozeki is pretty much a slam dunk case. Became uh, the first foreign-born Yokozuna in 93, as we mentioned there. Um, but yeah, so like it, that, that first year and a half where he won a bunch of tournaments, that was, that was his peak. He had a lot of injuries. He had a ton of Jun Yu shows that came up too, but... At least once a year, he had to pull out and, or sit out an entire tournament uh, all the way up until 2001 when he officially retired. That was coming off of a 14-1 and Basho the yeah. so we'll, time we'll, before, too. We'll, we'll get to the, uh, the ending of his story here, but there was some other uh, cool stuff during the 90s. Despite not being the, uh, you know, the most dominant Yokozuna, that honor had to go to Takano Hana during the 90s. Uh, Takano Hana got like twenty some tournaments. Yeah, he did really good. And I, I was actually I'm glad you brought up the rivalry because I apparently they were like huge rivals during the nineties. Absolutely, they were uh, credited as uh, bringing sumo back from a from a bit of a lull for at least a few years in popularity. Flair, can you do a little bit of quick research? I want to see when did Takano Hana and Wakano Hana become Yokozuna since they all started at the same time. I'm just kind of yeah. Why don't you bring that up? I believe Takano Hana was first because I think he was like one of the youngest ever. Yeah, I have a list here. We have Takano Hana was 1994, oh, so I just was a wrong. year Never after, mind. and Waku, Waku no Hana was 1998. Okay. okay, so it took him a quite a bit longer, but mm-hmm. yeah, okay. and that's that's kind of the same with uh, Musashi Maro. He kind of everybody thought he plateaued before a, a later career, late 90s, uh, came out of nowhere and just decided that he was going to be the most dominant guy for a bit. <laughs> but Akebono, yeah, he him versus Takano Hana was kind of the big the biggest individual rivalry of the 90s. Um, Takano Hana was supposed to walk Japan out into the 1998 Olympics, but he was ill, so they brought Akebono out. Nice. Oh, really? Yeah. So by then, he was a full citizen. I believe he got citizenship in 96. Um, but uh, I mean, he, they could have replaced him with the other brother, Nohana. Well, he was at, Yokozuna. But, but I don't think he was nearly as prestigious as Akebono, Akebono and Takano Hana were definitely the top two. Okay, so, yeah. it, I mean, if at that point they were both Japanese, so I that's mean, that's still super cool. It is, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it is. I, I think so too. Um, I, uh, I just I want to say there is a sweet YouTube video out there of the Akebono and Takano Hana rivalry. It's like a supercut of every single one of their matches. It is a must watch. It is really nice. Yeah, that's that's they, awesome. They always bring it like great intensely, intensely mm-hmm. every time they fight. And it's it's awesome because it's like a David versus Goliath kind of a matchup, but it's not it, it's not like uh, the the Goliath is not talented. Like they both are. Mm-hmm. They both clearly know what they're doing, and that's credited with their final record against each other of 25 to 25. Oh, wow. That's Perfectly awesome. <laughs> even. Um, but yeah, so like I said, he brought, he, he brought Sumo to a new level of popularity in the 90s uh, in, in conjunction with the other guys that we mentioned. Um, but yeah, like the, health, the health issues were piling up. So most of the, the second half of the 90s were rough for him. But... Excuse me. After uh, after a rough 1999, where he didn't even start three of the six tournaments, he comes back in 2000 and has his best year since the very beginning here. Um, so in 2000, he won 76 out of 90 matches, um, which is rarely eclipsed. He he had an 11 and four in January, and then he had and that was the most losses he had at any tournament of that entire year. He won the July and the November Basho. Um, but then the immediately after that November Basho, uh, is when he had to make his decision to retire. Um, so he, he just 
the health issues were too much, and uh, he he retired after sitting out the January Basho. I wonder how many times. I mean, obviously, we're not going to be able to look this up. But I'm just curious how often somebody is 14 and one wins the U show and then retires because yeah. it's the injuries just keep piling up and it's too much. Yeah, it it, it had to be a. Um, something something that made him decide suddenly that this is this is the last straw i mean i'm mm-hmm. i'm the best guy right now but can't can't keep it up yeah but ever since then uh he he left obviously he left being an active wrestler but he didn't immediately leave the sumo world he stuck around at azumazeki stable and helped uh you know helped coach um he actually was one of the guys who helped train asa shoryu uh, not the same stable, but they're in the same Ichiman, so they would train together, coach together, things like that. Um, but eventually, uh, he did he did leave sumo. He, he had a number of reasons, um, and primary among them, he wanted to raise his own children more than raise other wrestlers as an oyakata, was mm. the way he phrased it in a, a very excellent interview that I think we should tweet out, because there, there was a John Gunning and Akebono sit-down interview. It's like 40 minutes long. And yeah, that was that's one of the things he brought up as a, a reason that he didn't want to stick around in the sumo world forever. Yeah. So if we haven't tweeted this out by the time you're listening to this episode, feel free to tweet us to remind us <laughs> to tweet it out. <laughs> Flerick, take that down on there. Take that down on the official minutes. <gasps> um, he he doesn't regret leaving, but an, another uh, another thing that he mentioned in that interview was he claims that he was told he would never be able to rise to the very head of the sumo association. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. Right. And I don't know. I, I don't know enough about the situation to say too much more or have the, uh, you know, have some strong Cajones opinion on to it go out there and, and say it's because he's a foreigner. Yeah. But uh, but no, that's that was part of the insinuation there. But um, either way, that that was him leaving the Sumo Association just a couple years after officially retiring. And then he had a lot more famous uh ventures i guess we'll say nicely because he had a rough go of it in the early 2000s uh he went to uh he still had his uh his athleticism i mean when you retire from sumo it's usually because the injuries are too much the lifestyle is too demanding you can't keep up with that but that doesn't mean that you're completely broken and can't do anything anymore he wanted to use his athleticism to see if he could do uh uh more more different types of combat sports um so he tried kickboxing and he tried mixed martial arts and went a combined one and 13 yeah. in those two careers, giving him the nickname Make Bono. No. Yeah, I know, right? Cruel, but very clever, I yeah. think. Make being the Japanese word for losing. Um, but on that record are some prestigious names that he lost to. Uh, names like uh, UFC great Hoist Gracie, Don Fry, uh, Bob Sapp. He fought Bob Sapp twice. Uh, seven foot tall Korean kickboxer Hong Man Choi. He got knocked out by three times in a row. That yeah, that was a bit of a low point. Hmm. But uh, other than that, he also did pro wrestling. The highlight of his career at WrestleMania 21. Versus Shut up, the Ryan. Big Show. We don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was, I mean, you can look up this video. Uh, but uh, Ake Bono challenged the Big Show, the seven foot five hundred pound pro wrestler in the WWE challenged him to a sumo match at WrestleMania. What what year would that have been? WrestleMania 21. I'd have to do some quick math. But Early 2000s. Like, yeah. what, maybe 2005-ish, somewhere in there? Yeah, 2005, 6. Something like that. So right around that time, uh, he he obviously he still had athleticism, but wasn't uh, the, the kickboxing and the MMA didn't really work out. Uh, yeah, as a huge professional wrestling fan, I... Kind of in college, went back and rewatched all the old WrestleManias that I had missed when I was younger, and WrestleMania 21 was one of them. And watching the sumo match between Ake Bono and Big Show didn't really seem like anything out of place to me watching it. Rewatching it since I've started watching oh, sumo, and yeah. it's just a travesty. And you it's can tell awful. just how staged it is. I mean, it's wrestling, obviously, staged and everything scripted like that. But when you're staging like a sumo match to add like drama mm-hmm. and stuff to it, it just doesn't look good. There's a specific style of combat that you can stage in pro wrestling where 
I mean, regardless of your opinions on pro wrestling, you can make it look like you are competing properly Mm -hmm. and and do moves to each other and things like that. Sumo is not a rule set where you can make it look like you're competing if you're actually not. Yeah. It just very slowly Mm -hmm. bouncing off of each other, staring each other Leaning over the side really dramatically. Yeah. yeah. No, it it didn't work. It was... Akebono ended up winning the whole thing, but yeah. The the whole 30-second travesty there. But either way, that was... Fortunately, that was the low point of his pro wrestling career because he came back to Japan and wrestled basically everywhere, every promotion in Japan. He was mentored by the great Keiji Muto. Um, he is a triple crown heavyweight champion in AJPW, pretty prestigious there. And in 2015, actually started his own promotion called Odo. Um, and that, uh, unfortunately, was that, that's, that's kind of the main thing that he'd been doing recently. But unfortunately, in 2017, he started having some major health issues. So you can you can find news articles about this for more specifics. But uh, he he had some heart trouble, not uncommon for people his size with his career background, with all the things that he'd done to his body. Um, he actually, at several points, was put into medically induced comas um, all the way up until like March of 2018. Here is when he started to be recovering, as opposed to being you know, in his life being in danger. Um, there's been kind of depressingly little news about, about him since then. But, um, I, I did hear recently that he is, he's lost like 130 pounds, oh, wow. which I mean, I mean, for somebody that big guy was, that size, being, yeah. Being in a coma for that long. Yeah. I mean, sure. is he still, well, he wasn't coma, necessarily, he, he just he, recovered. He, he, no, he, he, he's been out of comas at least since March. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and but, then, do we know, is he in Japan right now? He in is America? in Japan. Okay. Um, and the most recent thing I could find, uh, credit to r slash uh, sumo on Reddit for helping me find some some information on him. He actually uh, has been giving Osuna Rashi mixed martial arts advice because oh, Osuna Rashi... Ryzen or how yep. it's pronounced. Yep. Nice. Uh, Osuna Rashi is going to be fighting Bob Sapp, someone that uh, Akebono had fought twice. Now... Isn't Bob Sapp a guy that had like a lot of hype when he first started, and then like one guy just like punched him in the face or punched him in the gut, and he crumbled and started crying? And Bob Sapp looks like a goddamn movie monster. Yeah, he's like six and a half feet tall. He's like four hundred pounds of shoulder muscle. Um, he looks awesome, and he, he. That's not to say that he was completely ineffective as a kickboxer, but he certainly looked better than he fought. Yeah. He's also over the hill, but he's he's one of those guys that um like you know Floyd Mayweather comes back to box now and then, right? And it's a big deal because he's a big celebrity even if he's over the hill, whatever. Bob Sapp's kind of in that situation. He's not officially retired or anything like that, but you know that he's not competing at a world championship level. Mm-hmm. I would like to Make sure everybody knows we don't think Floyd Mayweather is at the level of a Bob Sapp or like down that far. Oh, pfft, I, are was we trying to I was obviously not res- making that comparison. Are we trying yeah, to put but- respect to Floyd Mayweather? <laughs> well, yeah, he's, I don't think he's th- undefeated. He's 50 and 0 in his career. He's not yeah. the kind of guy that we need to suck up to on our podcast. Exactly. That's <laughs> I, I'm just trying to make sure people don't think that we're just <laughs> brushing off Floyd Mayweather like we don't understand how great he was at boxing. It took him nine or ten rounds to finish Conor McGregor. How good a boxer can he really be, right? That was <laughs> way more entertaining of a <laughs> moving fight than it on. Have been. Yes. No, no. I want to break down Conor McGregor versus Floyd Mayweather. So now. moving on. Mute his mic again or something. <laughs> oh, um, so uh, Ake Bono. The last we heard, he was uh, talking to Osuna Rashi. Yeah, we actually muted it. That's right. Um, but you can't silence me. <laughs> uh, but Ake Bono. Until we hear otherwise, I we we got to assume that he's on the path to recovery. Hopefully. Uh, hopefully he'll be okay, but it's it sounds like it's his pro wrestling career is probably over too. I I will say I think there was a quote they did ask like Are you going to be uh, fighting again? He said like Absolutely, like he fully intends to. Are you referring to that John Gunning interview? Um, I don't remember exactly because that I that interview was in 2016 where he wanted to fight until he was or wrestle until he was 50. But no, I'm talking about the one where he recently got out of the coma, like when he was still doing health issues. Like, oh, okay. Such, yeah. Uh, he yeah, still has like, I, whether or not that actually happens, I it definitely, I think uh, I'd be pretty skeptical, but yeah, I, I, I want uh, points to his actual, like uh, just uh, his frame of mind, like like where his, he really just really wants to kind of get on there. Like I'm not going to give up until the very end. Kind of he's, thing. he's not the kind of guy to, to give up. Exactly. His mind, competitive mind. spirit will be there forever. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, why don't we take a quick break and uh, come back and talk about Musashi Maru. 
All right. So next we're going to talk about the other American Yokozuna, Musashi Maru. And I, I kind of hate phrasing it that way, but that is kind of the role that he's in. I mean, I mean, even before sumo wrestling, I had heard of Ake Bono, yeah, but exactly. never heard of Musashi Maru. Right. So, I, I mean, I remember back like the very first time that I wasted several hours just delving through Wikipedia on sumo wrestling. It's like, oh, there was a second one. Cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, not, a, not as well known, but um, he is, uh, most notably, he is taking the Takamiyama route and has become a coach ever since he, was, uh, ever since he retired. But um, why don't we start at the beginning? He's just a couple years younger than Ake Bono, but um, got into sumo wrestling uh, about a year and a half after him in uh, 1989. And he wrestled all the way up until 2003. But as I mentioned in the previous section, he took a lot more time to get to the top. Um, He didn't become a Yokozuna until 1999. So he was only a Yokozuna for about four years at the end of his career, even though his career was like 14 years. Okay. But he was also from, uh, well, I mean... He he grew up in Hawaii. He was born in American Samoa, so that's that's his ancestry. But he uh, he spent a lot of time in Hawaii, um, and uh, he he kind of got his start in a similar way to Ake Bono. He's got a very different build. He's six three, but uh, he is a good deal wider, certainly proportionally wider. Um, so he did play football. That was his main thing. He also did a lot of Greco Roman wrestling. Um, and his Greco coach is the one who originally recommended he try sumo. Um, so despite getting a scholarship for football to uh, some local Hawaii universities, he decided to go to Japan and give sumo a try. He didn't go to the Azumazeki stable as most of the Americans we've talked about did. Um, he actually went to Musashigawa Bea, uh, which was led by uh, another former Yokozuna, Miyanomi. But he had just as rapid a rise at the beginning of his career. Uh, he made it all the way up to Makuchi in two years. Um, then he was Sekiwake for a while and made Ozeki in 1994. So he, he was an Ozeki for five straight years from 94 to 99 before he got that promotion. Okay. Which is still uh, the standing record for the slowest ascent to Yokozuna. Um, okay. He's spent- going to be... I mean, Goedo's never going to be Yokozuna, but... <laughs> but yeah, Goedo does... Your mouth. He, obviously, he's got the, um, the the longest running streak as an Ozeki. So it's been a little over four years, right? Uh, give or take. I, I don't know off the top of my head, well, but... how long the, was Kisei no Sato? I was just going to ring that up. Okay. Uh, Musashi Maru spent 32 Basho as an Ozeki before promotion. Kisei no Sato, 31. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I went back and had to double count, because that's, like, too poetic. And how long was Kodo Shogiku? But he never ascended, so I guess. Yeah. Right. So he was an Ozeki for a, a long ass time too. But yeah. Uh, either way, though, uh, Musashi Maru, uh, like we said, rocketed straight to the top. Well, the second from the top, just not the tippy top. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. The, not the tippy top, but it was still a rocketing. We'll he was. Say. He was a top four. Five, well, I guess they had like. How it many, depends three on how Yoko's many. There are, yeah, but five what, six guy his entire career. Regardless, nothing. Uh, nothing to be ashamed of there by any means. Um, but. Uh, he, he also, uh, like Ake Bono, was primarily a pusher-thruster earlier in his career. Um, didn't have the same speed, obviously, being like spherical as opposed to super, super tall. But um, yeah, he, he also had a, uh, a lot of reliance on his athleticism as opposed to his craftiness or technique or whatnot. Um, but as, as with Ake Bono, that technique did arrive, and uh, it took him until the end of the 90s uh, before he really put it all together. So definitely a late bloomer. Um, he he just hit another level in those late 90s. So how many Yusho did he have before promotion to Yokozuna? I'll bring that up to get you the exact number here. Um, he won five uh, as an Ozeki. Uh, his first okay. one was in 94, shortly after being promoted. He won another uh, playoff in 1996, then one in 1998, and then he finally strung two of them in a row in 1999. Okay. And this is where he he didn't come out of like nowhere, nowhere, but mm-hmm. like kind of semi nowhere. Um, Akabono and Takanohana were both in kind of rough shape at the the end of the 90s there. Um, so Musashi Maru finally got his chance. He put together consecutive 13 and twos in um, yeah, there you go, uh, consecutive 13 and twos in 1999, and got his promotion. He did not win his first Basho as a Yokozuna, but he won his second and third. So okay. that would mean a streak of five Basho, where he was the winner four of those five times. Very that impressive. was that was his best year ever. Um, but he didn't he didn't uh, 
really fade out shortly after due to injury the way that Akebono did. Um, he, he stuck around and was much healthier until his final year of sumo in 2003. But um, he did uh, one, one notable thing about, the, about injuries for him. He didn't ever miss a single match in his entire career until he was a Yokozuna, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is just startlingly so impressive. Over a decade then. Yeah, so his very first match that he ever missed... Uh, let's find that again, was in January of 2000, where he was East Yokozuna number one, which is like the, like the most prestigious of those Yokozuna slots, uh, where he went two and two and one and it, it was injured enough. He had to pull out, uh, two Basho later, he sat out all 15 and that was the first time he'd ever done that. Um, but yeah, still, still extremely impressive. Um, that was the first time he'd ever gone Kyujo and, uh, it ended a streak of 55 straight Kachi Koshis which wow. is the longest ever streak uh, like of all time. Uh, the second longest, uh, it, or sorry, it, it was the second longest streak in Makuuchi. Uh, Kitanomi, uh, another previous Yokozuna, had a longer streak in the top division. Mm-hmm. But if you're looking at it as a total career streak, uh, Musashi Mara's got the best one there. And that still stands even past Asha, Asa Shoryu and Hakuho. Those yep. guys probably Hakuho, had an injury or something. And Yep, I- exactly. Injuries was the only reason that Hakuho didn't pass him because Hakuho got a streak of 51. Oh, okay. But yeah, I just want to mention uh, on the whole didn't take a break until Yokozuna. We would like to sell on Kisino Salto, sell on Kisino Salto a lot, but he actually had the same exact thing. Up until he got injured with Yokozuna, he did not miss a match before that. Really? Oh, wow. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we should we should definitely give him slightly fewer jokes for that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what oh, happens well. come Aki. We'll see what happens come yeah. the next one, yeah. Uh, but no, oh, it, I, either way. Uh, it looks like he did have one Fusen loss. I actually lied about that in 2014. Yeah, so now we can rag on him all the way. (laughs) Commence ragging. We're back in business, guys. (laughs) Um, But yeah, Musashi Maru, uh, we're talking about him towards the end of his career. Uh, Like like I said uh, earlier, Taki Nohana was probably the best guy individually in the 90s, um, but towards the end of his career where uh, Akebono had kind of drifted off a little bit because of injuries, Musashi Maru was kind of the main main, uh, rival for Taki Nohana. Uh, and those two actually completed their last Basho at the exact same time in 2002. Uh, Musashi Maru actually won on day 15 against Takano Hana. Um, that was this one right here. So it was the last Basho that Musashi Maru won or finished. Uh, so he went 13-2, and two, like I said, beating Takano Hana. And after that, he'd never completed another one. So he tried like Aki 2002. Yep. He tried entering three more Basho uh, w- over the next year or so but just couldn't string it together and decided it was time to call it a career. He, uh, I, I, he, like, like we said, he didn't miss a lot of matches up until that very end, but he did have a ton of injuries that built up. Uh, specifically, he had a tendon in his wrist that needed significant repairing. He also had a chronic neck issues from his uh, high school football career. So yeah, he was, he was iffy that whole time, and he had to retire in 2002 there. Yeah, I know... We some of us watched the NHK preview for the Nagoya Basho, and they had a interview with Musashi Maru, and he was talking about how he always took real good care of his knees because, like, he had I don't remember exactly, but he'd seen a lot of people go out with that, so he always made sure he took really good care of his knees. And so, for somebody like his size to never really have any knee issues, like you said, it was like wrist and neck injuries that kind of took him out of it. Yeah, it's really impressive and something that seems like a lot of other people should try to emulate. Yeah, I, I misspoke a minute ago. He retired in 2003, not 2002. Um, since then, um, like I mentioned, he has gone into coaching. Uh, he trains both of the current Americans uh, in sumo. That would be Musashi Kuni, his own nephew. Flarek, we need to change that. Let's get into sumo. Let's get four Americans. Get four sumo. Americans? You and I. Let's go. The, the Grand Sumo Breakdown crew? Well, we already got. We need two people to stay here to cover us. And I can do that rise. part. Yeah, I'll do that part. But <laughs> are you sure? You need some backup? <laughs> no, nah, no, I got dibs on that part. Okay. We, we need to bolster the numbers of Americans in sumo wrestling. So I say us in our late 20s are the best <laughs> <laughs> examples. A, I'm pretty sure we can't enter sumo at our age. And B, really? Yeah. And getting yep, a, they have a cap. Yeah. And <sighs> uh, actually, the spots in Hayes are super competitive for foreigners. Like they actually oh, yeah. only really want people who are really athletic and are probably going to be. That was talented. one of the things I was going to bring up. Uh, mm-hmm. After these two guys went into sumo, they int- they not specifically because of these two, but also because of a lot of other Hawaiians and Mongolians coming in, they they wanted to limit the amount that sumo 
became a foreigner's sport. So they, they only, to this day, only allow one foreigner per stable. All right. Well, and there's a loophole in that that I'm about to get to here because but I first just said, I want to call to arms for all of our young, able-bodied oh, Americans <laughs> listening to this podcast. Let's bolster the numbers over in Japan. Oh, shut up. All right. So I, I said that Musashi Maru, who now goes by Musashi Gawa, uh, because that's the name of the stable that he runs, um, he Sorry, trains. Is that how they all work? Like the head guy at each table, or they? It's their name. That's oh, their it's name. the name they go by. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I didn't. Not, I didn't know that. I, yeah, I don't think always. Like, I think you can. It's like, the general you, practice. Though, it's right? general practice. Yeah. Usually, like there, there are these long stables. Are each month that are kind of controlled by one. The person running it might not actually have the uh, the elder name, elder stock. That actually is the name of it. Mm-hmm. But they are usually yeah. So, but usually they're somehow tied to the stable. Okay. Because I remember, there, I think it was Issei Gahama didn't have that name for a long time. And then he finally got the stock. And he said, I want to bring back the the nobleness of this name. Okay. Such. That, we can delve more into that later. I was just, did, never heard that before. So, mm-hmm. sorry. Yeah, so I guess to get at that, uh, here, the, the story of Musashi Maru's current name is kind of a, kind of a winding one. Because I, I mentioned before that he trained at Musashi Gawa Stable. Um, because that was the name of that Mia Nomi took the former Yokozuna who became that coach. So that's where Musashi Maru trained when Musashi Maru first retired. He, because he was a Yokozuna was entitled to keep his name, even though he stayed in the sumo world for five years. That's just their rule of thumb. He keeps his name Musashi Maru until he become until that five years runs out. If he's still staying in the sumo world as a coach or whatever, he has to take on an elder name. So he took on Furiwake. Um, but then as you know, these licenses get shifted around as different people retire from wrestling and different people retire from coaching. He ended up, uh, inheriting the name Musashi Gawa from his previous stable master and then started his own new stable. So it's a stable started from scratch, but because that was his name, that is now Musashi Gawa Beya. Okay. The previous Musashi Gawa Beya that he the the one that's continuing the lineage that he trained under is now Fujishima stable. Okay, I'm I'm gonna need like an hour long bonus episode of just you and Flarek walking me through like elder stocks and all of this <laughs> stuff because it confuses me so much. No, we have actually reached the limit of my understanding of it okay. so far. So I exactly. kind of want to end it now before we start sounding silly. Yeah, <laughs> it's it it's like its own like drama, like TV drama in itself. It all right, another like. call to arms to everybody listening to us. Whoever can explain this to me, <laughs> so I understand it, I will. Give you a shout out on Twitter. I don't know. Here, it's, it's I have very not going to be successful though. To, mm-hmm. It's not going to be successful though because it's you have it's to be a difficult, very patient to teach me. These it's a difficult concepts. topic, and also it's you. Yeah. So I am very uh, hard to teach. So <laughs> so back to whatever the hell we were talking about. What was it? Oh, uh, Musashi Maru, who now, who now goes by Musashi Gawa, the former um, Fudiwake. Yes. <laughs> The former Musashi Maru. Uh, he trains both current Americans and the loophole to get around that foreigner rule. Uh, his nephew Musashi Kuni is also Hawaiian. So he lists Hawaii as where he is from on the Bonske, right? That counts as their one foreigner slot. However, another wrestler that uh, we mention on our show a lot and hopefully our listeners follow as well is Waka Ichiro. Uh, his real name, Ichiro Young. He was born in Texas and raised there. Um, but technically he's not a foreigner because according to sumo rules, one of his parents is Japanese. So he can claim Nagasaki is where he's from. Awesome. So, I mean, he's about as American as anybody can be, right? But Born he's, and raised uh, in Texas. That's about as America as what I know. About as America as I know as well. But yeah. he claims Nagasaki, so that kind of gets him around that rule, and, uh, and that's how we got two Americans in one stable. Fun fact about that, I think when he turns like 19 or 20, he has to declare his citizenship to either the United States or Japan. Oh, there you yeah. go. Well, oh, he's how 19, old is he now? He's 19 right now, so maybe it's 20 or something. Yeah, it might be 20 or 21. I, I know there is a cutoff 22, date. 22, 23. Yeah. Japan, it, Japan, 27, 28. I have no idea. We're just yeah. shouting out numbers. Yeah. It, it's definitely in the early time around there, like 20-ish, 21. But I, I do know like Japan does not allow like dual citizenship at all. So you have to right. kind of declare. Even though the United States does, if you're declare in japan you have to uh revoke all of their citizenship and just yep. say you're part that was of the situation with akebono 
that's that's why it was we've mentioned it a couple times before but hakuho did not want to change his citizenship as an honor to his dad Mm -hmm. because it wouldn't be gaining a citizenship it would be changing so he'd be like losing his mongolian Mm -hmm. so and i don't think we've heard any updates on that since his father has passed he's he's probably gonna do it i mean yeah he's got other stuff it it sounds like now mm -hmm. it sounds like once he is done with sumo it sounds like he wants to stick around and be a coach and all that stuff I would sure hope so. He's certainly got knowledge to pass on. Yeah. Uh, to wrap up Musashi Maru's story so far, um, he was married in 2008, so this was a couple years after he retired, to a hula instructor, um, <laughs> and they have one son. And uh, most recently he's been in the news, other than, other than training the two Americans, of course, but most recently he's been in the news for uh, he fell ill while golfing with his wife in uh, early 2017 and uh, got one of her kidneys to recover. Oh, wow. Oh. Yeah, so they were apparently a good enough match that uh, she was able to save his life there. Uh, since then, though, he has been healthy. He's still coaching and all that. He's not, like, in, in current jeopardy or anything like that, but just a, a cool story and one of the more recent news articles I found about him. Really hope they have a nice, happy relationship. It's kind of hard to divorce somebody once you have their kidney inside of you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm sure that would be a major factor there. <laughs> mm-hmm. But no, it, it kind of scary to see both uh, both Akebono and Musashimaru in the news for health reasons at about the same time. But uh, Musashimaru seems to be getting the better of it. Akebono, there's there's less news, but in a way that's probably, probably good. good. <laughs> it's yeah. probably good that we're not getting you know constant updates on on whatnot. But but that was good to hear the the recent news that Osuna Rashi and and he were were at least communicating re, uh, regarding their common kickboxing opponent. Um, but to wrap this up, I looked at both of their uh, sumo records and compiled a couple bonus fun facts here just um excuse me just as uh you know combinations of their two careers uh so musashi maro he won uh 12 u shows akebono won 11 but uh combined over their entire two careers only 21 basho in that entire two careers uh was below sekitori rank so that's below jurio so, like, less most of th- them would be Musashi Maro, I would assume, since he had the slower. Well, the, both of them rocketed up to the Sekitori oh, okay, ranks. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Musashi Maro just kind of stalled at Ozeki. That's right, yeah. Because combined, they only spent eight Basho as Megashira. <laughs> they both just cruised right through there. Only five Basho combined in Jurio. Wow. So, yeah, the, they were guys that were destined to, uh, to get to the top from the beginning and took no, they wasted no time getting there. Um, but in 2003, when Musashi Maru retired, he was the last Hawaiian in sumo at the time, ending an era that went all the way back to 1964 with Takamiyama's entrance into sumo. So there was at least one. At least one Hawaiian. And okay. in 1997, there were four in Makuchi alone. That was uh, both of these two, and then Konishiki and Yamato, uh, two guys that we talked about in our previous episode. Konishiki got all the way up to Ozeki. Yamato uh, didn't get higher than Megashira, but that's still obviously a yeah. massive accomplishment. Yamato's the guy who uh, uh, grew up with Akebono uh, in Hawaii. But um, but that's all we got on these two guys for now. Um, we'd love to hear, if, uh, especially if anybody has news on Akebono's current health, that would be excellent to hear. I mean, if it's good news, it'd be awful to hear if it's bad news. But yeah, so don't uh, tell us. Don't tell us. Um, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> well, um, what was that thing we were tweeting out? Was it? Oh, it was the, the uh, forty-minute interview with John. The Gunning, John Gunning Akebono interview. So, uh, so now we definitely Flarek's better got, do it. Yeah, Flarek's got that in the minutes. So it, we'll tweet indeed. that out in addition to this episode. I'll also tweet out the Akebono talking to Hana supercut. Nice. Of all their yeah. Matches. Yeah. That that'll be a good one. I need to watch. It's gonna that be again. embarrassing when we tweet out absolutely none of these. Oh, when yeah. we completely forget both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, everybody. Point your fan mail or hate mail towards uh, Flarek on that one. We're putting the onus completely on him. Right, and I'll put it completely back on Jake. I don't think that's how it works. Um, how about Mac? Yeah, that's fair. Okay. Sounds good to me. Screw you, Mac. <laughs> and uh, we're coming out with at least one or two more bonus episodes before the September Basho, so stay tuned. Yep. And if you enjoy this podcast, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast listening service. Uh, check out Facebook and Twitter to find our tweets about the Akibona video and the John Gunny interview. You can check out our blog, grandsumobreakdown.wordpress.com, for fantasy sumo and power rankings and other goodies. And you can send us your complaints, questions, or whatever at grandsumobreakdown at gmail.com. Or if you want to give us a call, you can call us at 805-613-7866. That is 805-613-SUMO. 
And we will see and you for bye. next. Yeah, and that's bye. so awkward bye, without Mac. <laughs> yeah, I know. I forgot that I had to say like, see you next time. After that, so <laughs> see you next time. Uh, bye. Peace. Thank you for listening to Grand Sumo Breakdown. Until next time, throw your salt high and keep moving forward. It's not so easy to welcome to Grand Sumo Breakdown, is it, Jake? Are you waiting on me to say that? No, I, I'm waiting for you guys to say you're fucking ready. I'm fucking ready. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> do, do you want me to kick it off, or are you gonna? Just fucking do it. All right. <laughs> welcome to Grand Sumo Breakdown. <laughs> Damn it. Okay. There's not enough it's room. not so easy to welcome to Grand Sumo <laughs> Breakdown, right? <laughs> there wouldn't have been enough room between just fucking do it and welcome to grand sumo break <laughs> just down. say it we're, we're fine that would have been good to keep though i would have left uh we can do whatever the hell we want because it's time to welcome to grand sumo breakdown uh, this is ryan that one was much clumsier yeah just start off welcome to grand sumo breakdown this is ryan this is flerk this is jake and unfortunately mac cannot be with us today uh he's got some oh dang it i forgot my line for this yeah hold on well well, we'll jake try again well, Jake looks it up. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Ake Bono and Musashi Maru. We talked no, about. No, just start over. This one's really good. <laughs> Are you sure we could just blend this into the whole thing? Not really. It makes you look bad, but now makes I need me to happy. scroll back and find the text. The true reason why he insists on editing every time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just to make Jake look good. I'm just going to keep pretending like. This Have you is... listened to the final product? I can't even do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to keep pretending like we're going to keep all of this. And might as well save it. We'll put it at as a nugget after the after the end credits. I'm or sure there there'd be something good here yeah. if yeah. one of us actually wants to go through it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, but we'll see. Yeah. All right, are are you ready? Yes. Okay. Welcome to Grand Sumo Breakdown. This is Ryan. This is Flerk. This is Jake. And we're gonna awkwardly wait on me to continue this. I guess <laughs> I thought you um, were ready. I, I mean, I'm ready with I'm ready with my joke. I just hey, I wasn't hey, ready. Ryan, yeah, want, Flair. Want me to cool off that rice rice packet so you can <laughs> uh, cool your back from carrying this whole thing? Yeah, because I feel like I am gonna be carrying this podcast despite it being Jake heavy. He's should we should very we go much for take the three? <laughs> okay, so are you gonna just like drop off after we introduce our names? Because you didn't do that the first time, and then you did it the second time. That's true. That was very confusing, Ryan. <laughs> well, I wasn't hey, Ryan, sure what you Jake's plan. Cool that like rice pack. <laughs> cool my back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> apparently, Flarek is carrying this podcast today. Mm-hmm. All right, so I think I'll just yeah, I'll just leave it to silence. You'll say okay. I'm right. Jake. Thank you for communicating that ahead of our third yeah. attempt here. <laughs> All right, welcome to Grand Sumo Breakdown. This is Ryan. This is Flarek, and this is Jake. We don't have Mac with us today. Uh, Mac's not crazy. He's just a little unwell. I, I know right now you can't tell because he's not on the podcast. Yeah. Mac actually legitimately 100% hilariously has hand, foot, and mouth disease.